Kip, the story that you tell about the theoretical realization, development, discovery of all the physics of black holes to me is one of the great revelations of human history. It, it is, it, before any observations really were made, you, ha, you and your colleagues had developed the most remarkable theories. The story is a magnificent one. Give us a summary. Okay, well, this, I, I should say the summary largely precedes my career. <laughs> I entered this field just at the moment that the first observational evidence for black holes started to come in with the discovery of quasars. Mm. I was a student. So this is a story during my childhood and uh, a little before. Uh, it begins uh, with Einstein. The modern th uh, part of the story begins with Einstein uh, discovering or creating general relativity as the uh, laws of warped space and time. Uh, within uh, a matter of months after Einstein uh, uh, formulated the laws, Carl Schwarzschild, the great astronomer of that era and astrophysicist, found a solution, a mathematical solution to Einstein's equations which describes a black hole. But nobody then, this is now uh, 1917, nobody then knew that that's what it described, but it was a very strange solution. It really required until the late 1930s uh, for people to uh, think their way through this, and the uh, real breakthrough came from Robert Oppenheimer and his student Hartman Snyder. Oppenheimer, this, this was just before the war, shortly before Oppenheimer uh, it was brought in to lead the atomic bomb project in the United States. Uh, Oppenheimer uh, and, uh, and Snyder were shuttling back and forth between Caltech and Berkeley where they had joint appointments. Uh, and during that period, uh, getting the astrophysical st uh, stimulus from the astronomers uh, here at Caltech, uh, they thought through the mathematics of this. They uh, did uh, further calculations and uh, imagined a star that implodes, and they saw it forming this solution to Schwarzschild, this object. And they saw that as it imploded, there was a horizon form, nothing could get out. They saw it implode, form a singularity at the center, uh, and they published their result. And uh, this was the prediction of black holes. It was so bizarre, just so bizarre, that uh, people really didn't believe uh, what was being said, basically. And the war intervened. People paid relatively little attention through the war. After the war, uh, my personal mentor, John Wheeler, uh, took up this subject. He looked at uh, the solution of, of, uh, by uh, Oppenheimer and Snyder of an imploding object that forms a black hole. And he said, that makes no physical sense. <laughs> there has to be some way that radiation can get out. And he struggled for several years trying to figure out how to get around the conundrum of creation of a singularity, which is anathema because the laws of physics would break down. We now know it's, it's the place where new laws of physics come in. Uh, Wheeler just couldn't, couldn't swallow this, uh, and he couldn't swallow the idea that, that uh, this was all hidden until after just struggling and struggling, there was, there was just no choice. It, he was forced into the conclusion that Oppenheimer and Snyder were right. But then he taught me and uh, I taught the world of physicists that here is an object that is tremendously powerful for our coming to grips with the mysteries of the laws of nature. Yeah. Uh, the first observational evidence, uh, well, so, so then I should say there remained resistance up until about 1970 among physicists to this. Uh, for example, there were many physicists who said, well, these things can't form in nature. If you have an imploding star, sure, if it's like Oppenheimer and Snyder, precisely spherical as it implodes, then it will form a black hole. But if it's not precisely spherical, yeah. uh, there will be no black hole. Uh, there will be something else happening. You don't have to deal with this in the real world. Well, and so other theorists, particularly Igor Novikov in, the, uh, in Russia and Richard Price, who was a student of mine at Caltech uh, in around 1971, they went in and they did careful mathematical analyses and showed, no, if you have an implosion that is not precisely spherical, still you will get a black hole. And so finally, by the early 70s, as the observations were mounding that these things might really exist, uh, through X-ray observations primarily, a new field of X-ray astronomy, 
the theorists, independently of those observations, were coming to, uh, to the conclusion there is no escape. Mm. These objects must exist, they must be robust, they must form when massive stars die. And now we're at the point where they are really essential to the formation of the structure of the universe in the yeah. center of galaxies. They play major roles in the universe, we now know, uh, through observations uh, and then theoretical modeling associated with the observations. But to make real progress on the nature of a black hole, that could be done, and, ex and th that they should exist, that could be done without observation, just by having confidence in Einstein's laws. But to figure out that they really are out there, and what they do in the universe, and how they are the dominant objects of the centers of galaxies, how they really are the endpoint of deaths of massive stars, mm. that required extensive observation by uh, a huge number of very talented astronomers. So as you look at black holes, having experienced it now for 50 years, 40 years? 50 years, 50 years. <laughs> yeah, I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> what? Emotion do you feel in your guts when you when you think about it? I mean to, to me coming Meeting it knowing it and then feeling it through your book. has just been an extraordinary well, experience I mean they are wonderful objects for me as a physicist to study Because they teach us so much about the warping of space and time about the uh, the connections between general relativity and quantum theory they they are powerful tools for trying to puzzle out the laws of nature. That, so to me, that's the awe of them. Of course, uh, when I'm in a different role, uh, for example, consulting on a science fiction movie, the awe is something else. But when I'm a physicist, their ability to probe the laws of nature is really the exciting thing.